Um, I think the origins of the project lie in my research trajectory that um, I began really as a South Africanist and I was interested in the British colonial governance of South Africa. Uh, and in that light, I came across certain officials at the colonial office uh, whose responsibility extended to Southern Africa. But then later in my career, I moved on to look at colonial Australia, uh, where British settlers also fanned out during the 19th century. Uh, and realised that, of course, it's exactly the same officials sitting in London at their desks whom Australian colonists and governors are concerned with. Uh, and it made me think how artificial many historians view of the governance of the British Empire as a whole was. Because most historians are only interested in one part of the empire, they tend to think of the officials sitting in London uh, as only having an interest or only having relevance for that particular part of the empire. One of these officials in particular who cropped up all around the, the world in the early 19th century was the permanent undersecretary at the colonial office, a chap called James Stephen. And I kept coming across James Stephen in relation to South Africanists, writing about how influential he was in the Cape Colony, and then Australianists talking about how influential he was in New South Wales. Uh, and it made me think, well, what did the empire look like from um, Stephen's perspective when he's dealing with so many colonies all at once? Uh, and during his period at the colonial office, there were between 35 and 40 British colonies for which he was responsible. So the, the genesis for this book really came from um, a few days spent in uh, the National Archive, looking through the registers of correspondence that James Stephen dealt with on any particular day and during any particular week. And realising that from his perspective, he simply had no time to dwell on any particular colony or on any particular agenda. Uh, because he had dispatches coming in every day from 40 odd colonies or nearly 40 colonies and was constantly trying to reconcile crises which were occurring simultaneously around the world. And I thought, well, no one's really written uh, about imperial governance from that perspective of everywhere and all at once. So that's really what lay behind uh, this book, uh, an attempt to try and see what it was to govern the empire everywhere and all at once, rather than just one place at a time or one theme at a time. But then that um, generated a whole series of logistical problems, uh, as Kate and Pete know all too well from trawling through the correspondence. Uh, it's impossible to look everywhere and all at once for any extended time period. There is just such a volume of correspondence. And I'll ask them to talk a little bit about the correspondence they were looking at as part of the project in a bit. Uh, so some kind of selectivity was necessary. And that led me to think, well, if you take three years, three sample years through the 19th century and you try and examine what imperial government, government was trying to do throughout those three years, roughly um, distributed across the 19th century. And I wanted to go for early Victorian, mid Victorian and late Victorian years. Uh, and I thought that that kind of interval, roughly 20 to 30 year intervals, would enable us to appreciate the effects of changing technology. So our first sort of snapshot year of everywhere and all at once, the empire was 1838, which was when most communications were still sail ships, uh, but with steamships just about to be used, just coming into use. Um, 1857, our second year, uh, is to see the beginning of telegraph, but with steamships very well established, carrying these uh, communications across the empire. And in 1879, the telegraph is not universally, but fairly uniformly established as a, a mode of imperial communication. So those three years were chosen, but also because of what happened in those years. You know, I was, I was aware that there were multiple crises that the imperial government was dealing with, and that those crises would enable us to address certain thematic features of the empire too. And here, I suppose, is where the fact that historians are always write within a contemporary political framework comes into play. You, you can't help but be part of the milieu in which you are writing. And at the moment, local culture wars are raging in Britain about what the empire's legacy was um, and how our imperial past relates to Britishness today. Um, and many patriotic historians of Britain would like us to believe that the British Empire was fundamentally a benevolent institution, that it brought modernization and progress and civilization would have been the Victorian word uh, to much of the world, uh, a quarter of the world that was governed by the empire. Uh, and it made me think, well, the imperial administrators of their day also believed, uh, many of them, that the empire should be benevolent. Um, and I thought about what words imperial administrators used to uh, exemplify their intentions, the agendas that they wanted to carry out in the empire. 
And freedom was a word that was very much used in 1838, our first snapshot. Uh, it was the year in which formerly enslaved subjects of Britain finally achieved their freedom. Uh, they were released from apprenticeships and allowed to choose their own employers for the first time. It was also a year in which free trade was being expostulated as a key virtue of Britain's political economy. Uh, and a year in which British settlers overseas were demanding the freedom to govern themselves. So those three kinds of freedom, uh, free labour, free trade and freedom of political governance uh, were commonly discussed among imperial officials in 1838. And that became the theme of that first snapshot. But a second word, um, I've already mentioned it, uh, which still lies behind many imperial apologists view of the empire was that it brought civilization. And many today wouldn't use that precise word. They would say things like modernization or global integration or progress. Um, but civilization was the word that was used by many imperial administrators uh, around the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and in 1857, our second year, we can see the impact of attempts to enforce civilization, to impose civilization on imperial subjects around the world, whether they liked it or not. Uh, and one of the repercussions of that um, speaking loosely, was the Indian uprising of that year, of 1857. And then finally, by 1879, most Britons were convinced that their empire was uh, a uniquely liberal one. Uh, and today, many apologists for the British Empire also draw attention to its fundamental liberalism, uh, claiming that the British Empire was different in fundamental respects from other modern empires because it wasn't so autocratic, because it had these values of liberalism at its core. And certainly in 1879, the majority of Britons themselves believed that their empire was fundamentally liberal. But what the book argues through looking at what actually happened, wars of imperial aggression, particularly in Afghanistan and in Southern Africa during that year, um, was a disavowal uh, of what imperial governance meant in practice for colonized subjects who were not seen as eligible for the kind of rights of liberalism and the responsibilities of liberalism that British subjects in Britain itself shared. So that's the kind of, you know, the architecture of the book and the genesis of the book. Um, I, there was no way I could have done this on my own. Uh, and so the Lieberhume Trust kindly gave us uh, some funding so that Kate and Pete could help. Um, and broadly, they had a division of labour where Kate looked mainly at colonial office archives at, at the National Archive. Uh, and Pete looked at uh, India office records at the British Library. So I'll hand over to each of them in, in turn and uh, you can let us know what it was like to wade through all this stuff. <laughs> I don't know if you want to go first, Kate. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, so looking at the colonial office records, I suppose the, um, the main thing I think we were thinking about when going into it was this question of simultaneity. And, but I suppose that's, it's kind of a, Brought question when thinking about the archives because um, you know they were receiving information from all the different colonies and you know so they would be looking at materials that had arrived that had been written in Australia you know three months earlier and things that had been written in in Malta only a couple of weeks earlier and processing them at the same time so we kind of focused in on thinking about kind of so in terms of our snapshots like looking at those time periods for when the officials in the colonial office would have been viewing those materials and processing those materials, which kind of raises all sorts of interesting questions about this idea of simultaneity, about kind of processing events long past with things that are only recently past. And then kind of as we progress through the century, um, how that time lag narrowed with technological developments. And so, you know, so by 1879, the time difference between when they would be looking at materials from kind of the farthest reaches of the empire and the closest reaches of the empire would have been much, much closer together. Um, so kind of looking at all the incoming, incoming and outgoing correspondence for the colonial office during these time periods, sort of thinking about what was being processed in the office in 1838, 1857, 1879. Um, and so it's one of the things that I, kind of really focused in on as well was looking for kind of the marginalia, looking for the that internal commentary on what was coming in, sort of those voices of of the officials, how they were processing them. First of all, whose voices? So, you know, in 1838, it's overwhelmingly James Stevens, whose kind of comments you see kind of coming in and, and then later penning those responses, but sort of how they're being processed internally and also how they're being processed in um, in kind of communication with the other offices of um, 
of the imperial government. So in the case of the colonial office, you see a lot of communication between the colonial office and the treasury in particular. You know, so you get requests coming in from the colonies, then being kind of processed internally, and then kind of going to the treasury saying, do we have the money for this? Can we have the money for this? And then kind of processing it again, and then going back. Um, and yeah, and also kind of as well thinking about um, thinking about um, kind of this how they were looking at kind of center. So the center of concern, as it was. So we're thinking about 1857, for instance. Um, kind of the book highlights these you know, key crises in, in China, in India, for instance, but also looking at what was happening elsewhere in the empire on those peripheries. So I think in the correspondence, you really get this sense of kind of a shifting periphery as it is, um, where you have these kind of key crises and um, kind of more peripheral events, but conversely kind of for the people writing, um, you get a real sense that kind of their, their sense of the center and the peripheries is very different. Um, and kind of how that's being reflected in the in the documents as well. Um, so I'll hand over to Pete now to give the India office side. Uh, thanks both. Um, it, the, I mean, the, the India office records is, is what I did my PhD on, which is how I ended up in, in, in this world. But um, it's, I mean, the first thing to say about it is that it's huge. Um, it's nine miles of shelves. And it's quite heavily mediated. Uh, it all came from, you know, it's the entire history of the East India Company and the Energy Office. And it's all in one room with the British Library, a bit like the Colonial Office is accessible through the National Archives. But it does have its own particular archival history that's not the history of most of the archives of the British state, um, at least not till 1858 when the East India Company became the India Office. Um, what's uh, a there's a few things to say about the archive in, in a kind of textual way that I think are interesting. Uh, firstly, um, while I do regret that I wasn't more systematic in the work I did for this project, um, in that archive, what this project allowed me to do was to follow the grain of the archive in a conscious way that I think was very, um, that was really productive because I could just sit down, call up a core meeting of the East India Company and then read it all the way through every single word which obviously you can't do that for every single court meeting but you do get a sense of the kind of the texture and the fine grain of everyday corporate life you get a more kind of anthropological sense of what's happening in offices you can read a you can read a memo and see whose desk gets passed over on which date whose office it's sat in for a week where it's been filed and in, in different um, volumes and so on um, one of the challenges is that obviously the East India Company, while it is a very self-contained world, is a very different organisation from the rest of the British state. So the continuities between 1838 and 1857 and then on to 1879 are a bit choppy. Um, but you are aware that you're dealing with a particular kind of office culture, um, which is with its own language and its own rituals, um, some of it quite highly formalised. Um, which is really fun, uh, but it's also highly centralised. So you get to see how uh, a very, very small amount of men um, rule over several, you know, a million people or so. Um, well, uh, as, as as Kate said, there's a there's an issue with uh, with the length of communication, the problem of control at a distance, where you have to find the rhythm of there are different cycles of communication going backwards and forwards. And this is something that I'm sure we'll discuss with reference, especially in 19, to 1860, 1857, sorry. Um, you get used to the three month cycle of certain dispatches and the six month cycle of them returning and being annotated. And then there's the cycles within London as things um, circulate between the East India Company and the Board of Control or around the India office in 1879. Um, so you can sense how bureaucrats and bureaucratic structures were always struggling to cope not with a constant stream of information coming in and going out but with different cycles on different time scales all simultaneously so different kind of simultaneity there I think I hope that wasn't too abstract no, that's great for me. thanks uh, I think we'll kind of have a, a an iteration of questions coming in as, as they come in and then um, we can say a bit more about some of the themes and pick up in between those those questions We've got a few questions, uh, a couple of questions already. Uh, so one of them, what about uh, Ronald Hyams, Elgin and Churchill? 
for an empire-wide perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think um, using biography of key figures uh, is something that I've found very productive in the past as well, to link multiple places within the empire. Um, and people were highly mobile across the empire. And even if they weren't personally mobile, they considered various terrains, various colonies within the empire simultaneously. Uh, Elgin and Churchill being good examples uh, of, of both being mobile, but also thinking about various imperial interconnections. Um, Clearly, you know, this uh, high end focuses on those two individuals and the places that they embody. Uh, ruling the world, we want it to be a bit more extensive in our coverage, cast the net a bit further. So in the appendix, there are potted biographies of some 70 to 80 characters uh, whose movements and whose consideration of different places come into play throughout the three snapshot periods. Um, so we couldn't get that kind of more comprehensive coverage of everywhere all at once if we narrowed it down to just a few uh, individuals. Although one thing we've tried to do is build in individual perspectives and experiences uh, uh, and individual um, uh, contributions to imperial history throughout. So the, the book is densely populated with multiple characters. Um, I don't know if uh, you want to add anything to that, Peter, okay, or move on to the next question. Um, I can direct your attention uh, to, the, to the cast of characters at, at the end of the book, which is really useful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the necessary. Uh, yeah, that's right. There, there are too many people for us to, to just leave them hanging in various pages. But there is a, an appendix which has these party biographies that you can refer to them as and when they crop up again. Um, particularly because some individuals occur in more than one of the snapshots. They're there in 1838, but they're also there in 1857, for instance. So you can look them up again the second time they crop up in the narrative. Uh, the next question is, um, in regard to freedom being so important as a word in 1838, how did people within the empire, British and non-British, deal with the continuation of certain types of slavery, such as Māori slavery in New Zealand and Indian slavery in the subcontinent? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and both those things are actually addressed in the book. Um, what we try to do in our snapshot of 1838 is precisely problematize this issue of freedom. Who was it uh, that was deserving of freedom, that was seen as deserving of freedom by the imperial government, and who actually was freed from coercive labor relations, and which kind of imperial subjects were left in coercive labor relations? This was precisely the issue that James Stephen, the permanent undersecretary, had to grapple with, actually. Because the 1833 Act abolishing slavery in the British Empire didn't give him much guidance on exactly what slavery was, who was subject to it and who wasn't. What guidance he used really came from the, the focus of the British anti-slavery campaign, which was almost overwhelmingly directed at Caribbean forms of slavery. So it was looking at enslaved people of African descent in the West Indian colonies. Um, they were clearly the primary intended beneficiaries of the British anti-slavery campaign. Stephen then had to work out what other kinds of uh, people in coercive labour relations should also be freed under the remit of that act. Now, the act did specify two other colonies, Cape Colony and Mauritius. Uh, there also enslaved people were to be freed uh, by 1838 with the end of apprenticeships. Uh, this sort of extended period of coerced labour that enslaved people passed into from 1834. Uh, and there was consideration of India. Uh, the East India Company had toyed with the idea of freeing enslaved Indians before. And these were obviously indigenous forms of Indian slavery, with the majority of enslaved Indians being owned by other Indian British subjects. Um, in 1833, when the charter was renewed for the East India Company, at exactly the same time that the Anti-Slavery Act was passed in relation to the Caribbean, the Cape and Mauritius, the decision was taken to leave Indians in that enslaved state. Uh, and people like Macaulay, Zachary Macaulay in this case, justified that with the idea that it wasn't Britons who had brought about these institutions of slavery in India. They had simply inherited Indian forms of slavery when they took over the subcontinent. And therefore, Britons didn't bear the primary responsibility to free enslaved Indians. And it wasn't until much later that um, slavery in, in British India was declared illegal. Similarly, there was a, a brief mention uh, among some of the early traders who were operating in New Zealand a couple of years prior to the, the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, when British colonialism was extended there, who were pointing out that there were Māori forms of slavery and that Britain was increasingly 
edging towards sovereignty over these and what should be done about them. Uh, but again, a similar kind of pretext was used that these were not British imposed, British innovated forms of enslavement, uh, and therefore they didn't fit within this remit of the Anti-Slavery Act. Um, and during 1838, Stephen also decided that other forms of coerced labour, such as the private assignment of convicts to Australian settlers, um, interestingly, uh, a group of people uh, who should have been you know, often thought of as being primary beneficiaries of ideas of freedom, and these were so-called liberated Africans. So one of the things that um, you know, patriotic British historians are most proud of uh, is that uh, after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, the Royal Navy was tasked with intercepting other countries' slave ships and freeing the enslaved cargo from those ships. Uh, but what a lot of Britons don't appreciate is what happened next to those so-called liberated Africans. And many historians today actually call them recaptives because the majority were taken to Sierra Leone and they were given as unpaid apprentice labor for 15 years to free settlers in Sierra Leone, both white and black settlers. Very, very few of them could ever make it home uh, to the regions from which they were they captured in the first place, partly because they would expose themselves to the risk of recapture by slaving uh, parties uh, in along West Africa. So this was another category of coerced labor, uh, these liberated Africans or recaptives, whichever phrase you want to use, in Sierra Leone that Stephen explicitly considered uh, to see whether they should be eligible for freedom alongside the former slaves of the Caribbean and decided that they shouldn't. So that, those, are, those apprenticeship um, allocations carried on for another 15 years or so in Sierra Leone. Okay, um, there's another question. Uh, what kind of data visualization methods did you use for the project and book? For example, to look at information flows in and around imperial networks and their historical geographies. And there's a question 2.2, but I'll come on to that in a, in a bit. Um, I think really we would have loved to have used data visualization methods. We, we didn't in the end. This, this is a, largely a, a textual analysis which picks up various themes and tracks various biographies across the empire. So about the sort of most sophisticated data visualization is a series of maps of what the empire looked like in our three snapshot years and some particularly significant parts like Southern Africa in 1879, India in 1857. Um, the Levy Hume Trust was generous in its funding to enable Kate and Pete to be employed on the, the project and for us to wade through all this textual data. Uh, but we would have to have gone for another research grant in order to take those visualization techniques further and do something a bit more sort of wizardry with them. Uh, I don't know if Kate and Pete, you want to add anything to that? No, okay. <laughs> it would have been cool to do a whole a whole second book on on uh, on, on 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 quantitative analyses of, of paperwork going back and forth, but uh, it'll have to wait. I mean, unless yeah. you include some very strategic doodles of um, kind of information moving between the offices. I mean, not not really. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, that's where we fell short. Uh, question 2.2. From your research, are you able to visualise, spatialise the structure of British colonial administration, the colonial office and its bureaucracies and departments? Um, well, in a kind of loose way. Uh, we haven't got diagrams of uh, administrative structures. We describe them for each of our three snapshot years. Of course, part of the problem is that this is an ever-evolving dynamic picture. Uh, so in 1838, James Stephen had just finished the process of reforming the way that the colonial office bureaucracy worked. Uh, so any diagram we did for 1834 would have to be different for 1838. Uh, and this was partly what we were trying to capture with the um, snapshots focusing on different uh, technologies being dominant uh, because the way that the bureaucracy changes is partly to do with the way that communications infrastructure changes as steamships speed things up as the telegraph speeds things up even more but on the other hand leads to a much more sort of snippet approach to, to information uh, so by the 1860s the colonial office is employing someone 24 hours to look at uh, real-time information coming in through telegraph uh, but then waiting on the next ship arrival, steamship arrival, to get a fuller picture of what the telegraph is, is telling them. Um, so this, this bureaucratic structure, even if we had drawn a, a diagram, it would have been just a, a snapshot, a moment in time. Uh, so our, our analysis is, is textual, again, of the, these changes in um, 
bureaucratic departments. While we're talking about departments, so one of the things I did want to, to say a bit more about was that um, through this everywhere and all at once approach, we became a lot more aware, as, as Kate actually was mentioning earlier, uh, that there wasn't an imperial government. Um, what there was was uh, different offices which have responsibilities for different parts of imperial governance, but an ever shifting away of relations between them. Um, so those most directly concerned in imperial governance were the, the colonial offices we've heard and the East India Company in 1858 and then the India office. Um, but they were reliant on relationships with the War Office, the Admiralty, the Treasury to secure a distribution of resources uh, that was favourable to them. They were vying with one another, competitors as well as collaborators. Um, and you also had the Foreign Office, which plays an extremely important role uh, in imperial history, even though it's often uh, occluded from imperial historians' analyses because they tend to go either straight to the India office or straight to the colonial office. Um, but the, the Foreign Office was critical, for instance, in positioning the empire as a whole geopolitically within the world. Um, quite often it would be drawn into conflicts with Russia, which led to two occupations, two disastrous occupations of Afghanistan, for instance. Yeah and both of which had effects in the colonial office sphere of the empire. Um, so it's these real interdepartmental relations are absolutely critical. Um, and we found that 1857 and 1858, the response to the Indian uprising was a major spur to the reform of imperial governance as a whole. And it was one of the things which created this need for a much more integrated form of imperial government. Uh, and which spurred on the bringing of different departments together around the, the new, what is now the Foreign Office building uh, at St. James's Street. Uh, so that, that building embodied a kind of centralisation and a greater integration of imperial governance by 1879. Okay, next question. Just check I'm not missing any out here. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you could say more about how the colonial mindset and presumptions of administrators like James Stephen and Thomas Elliot was cultivated and developed in terms of Peter's point about office culture. Well, yeah, I think this brings us back to um, one of the sort of standards of imperial historiography, Robinson and Keller's uh, approach to the official mind, uh, which was the supposition that imperial administrators shared a certain cultural background, a certain set of education and attainments, a certain sort of dispossession and view of the world. Um, and we chart the changes in that through the, the three years. So by 1879, for instance, it was very common for imperial administrators in St. James's Street, in the Foreign Office, Colonial Office and the India Office to have gone to Eton. Eton became a kind of almost a monopoly uh, supply line uh, for imperial administrators. Um, prior to that, there were clearly gentlemen, the attributes of the senior clerks, uh, they attended the same events, they knew that had the same people in common socially within their social networks. Um, so there is definitely a, a kind of an official mind, a kind of worldview, but that's not to say that there was consensus uh, among them. Uh, and a number of the issues that we look at, uh, there was a great degree of contention about how to deal with some of these crises. Um, so I think you have to sort of narrow it down a bit more than, than just the official mind and take some of these characters, as we were saying before, their biographies seriously as individuals uh, and their individual background to, to understand their role in imperial administration. Uh, but Peter, I don't know if you want to say more about that, uh, considering you, you made that point about office culture. Um, yeah, maybe a little. I mean, the... Uh... I think this does articulate slightly to the, and I don't want to harp too much on the cultural aspects of what we're doing, but obviously this stuff is very much in, in, in the discourse at the moment. This does kind of articulate to how a lot of the thinness of the public debate around the memory of imperialism um, is connected to uh, a misunderstanding of the kind of really varied and contested ideological terrain of the people who run the empire. Um, there, you know, I, I think uh, there's the there's some. I can say it's brilliant because I didn't write that bit. The bit about 1838 in this book, like, kind of makes makes clear that a lot of the impetus behind uh, behind abolitionism, behind um, behind Aboriginal rights, etc., um, was coming from the Clapham sect. It was coming from various kind of uh, uh, Christian um, Christian organisations and um, you know there's there's these weird countercurrents that aren't either imperialist or anti-imperialist. They're currents within within an imperial culture and society. 
And um, I think paying attention to the changes in that. So like on the thin and later slap shots, we've got, you know, quite a lot of Etonians. If we'd carried it on, we would have seen more Balliol men coming in. Um, if you're interested in the um, in the socialization of imperial elites, uh, I think I've just read, reread um, Richard Simon's Oxford and Empire, which is really good on the kind of creation of Oxford as an imperial university and the creation of various kinds of imperial man uh, and ways of being a man within it. Um, but for that, you can uh, you can read my book that's out in, in summer. Nice plug, Pete. Well done. <laughs> um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, the other thing I was going to say about that was that these um, snapshots enable us to look at that changing culture of imperial bureaucracy from one year to the next. So to give one example, in 1838, most of the empire was still governed by men who actively fought to expand the British Empire during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. These were largely soldiers with battlefield experience who had killed to create the British Empire. And they ruled largely as autocrats. Um, and partly that's to do with the imperial communications infrastructure. The slow passage of messages meant that they had a higher degree of autonomy. Um, as we move to 1857, we begin that snapshot with a kind of recap of what's changed in the meantime. Uh, and by 1857, you definitely get the sense that there's a new breed of imperial administrator, uh, particularly at the gubernatorial, the governorship level. So we look at men like George Gray uh, and Henry Bowring. Uh, who didn't have that battlefield experience. Gray had a, a military background, but both of them were more kind of intellectuals uh, from a more sort of commercial middle class background who had inherited an empire and inherited a sense of the superiority and the dominance, uh, technological dominance of that empire and who were convinced of the superiority of Britons rather than having to, to fight for it on the battlefield. And many of their actions were explained by that. And one of the causes of the Second Opium War was uh, Bowring's uh, utter astonishment that the Chinese governor in Canton refused to meet him within the walled city, but he was relegated to, to be kept outside the city gates, which he saw as an offence to his status as a, a, an Englishman. Uh, and he was absolutely determined to storm those gates for whatever pretext. And that's not the only reason for the Second Opium War, but it certainly had a lot to do with it. Uh, so that sort of changing culture of, uh, of uh, the background of, of imperial administrators is something that I think the snapshots enable us to, to address to a certain extent. Kate, did you want to add, any, add anything about the, uh, the colonial office officials? Um, I mean, I think you've mostly kind of said it, really. Um, I suppose the only other thing I would possibly note as well is just kind of the yeah, I mean, um, you said, but also kind of the importance of the fact that some of these officials moved between offices and also moved between kind of colonial governments and then back to London and kind of the influence of those sort of circulations on the development of kind of the, the culture of the colonial office as well. Um, I mean, Elliot being um, an interesting example, kind of moving between the um, immigration office and then back to the colonial office and then kind of that um the influence of that and kind of the policies he um promoted in terms of um you know the immigration of kind of poor Britons to place like south africa um so i think it's um so that certainly played a, a significant role as well um, yeah thanks okay we've got another question um you spoke about the importance of the concepts of civilization in the management of the british empire how is this manifest, if at all, in dealing with the sepoy mutiny in 1857? OK, um, well, uh, I'll let Pete answer this in a bit as, as well, uh, just to give my quick response. I think that role of a kind of a British conviction of a superior civilization and the determination to impose it on others, regardless of the, the violence required to do so, um, was one of the reasons why there was an uprising. Uh, in India in 1857. Uh, and of course, it, it well, was a sepoy mutiny, but that was not all that it was. Um, it was because the sepoys company infantry, East India Company infantry, um, rebelled against their officers that an opportunity was opened for a much broader array of Indian subjects of Britain to rebel uh, across Northern India, a whole swathe of Northern India, um, involving every tier of Indian society, not just soldiers, not just those in the East India Company army, which is the reason why it's generally referred to as the uprising rather than the mutiny uh, by most historians uh, of India today. Um, and that the reason why there was such a broad alliance 
states who were willing to seize that opportunity of an army mutiny to spread a rebellion, a much broader uprising, was to, very um, generally to do with this imposition of British civilizational norms, whether Indians liked it or not. Just to give one small example, um, as many of you will, will know, the uh, East India Company collected revenue from Indians in part to supply East India Company shareholders in Britain with guaranteed dividends. Uh, under the 1833 Charter Renewal, they were guaranteed 10.5% dividends, which had to come not through trade anymore after 1833, but from rent collection from Indians for the privilege of being governed by the company. And up until the 1840s, 1850s, indigenous locally recognized systems of, of revenue collection were able to do that, partly by waiving um, taxes on religious institutions, for instance, uh, for certain uh, powerful individuals would have taxes waived on them to secure their consent. So there's a whole array of consensual local level arrangements. But by the 1850s, this going back to the previous question, actually, a new generation of company officials who've been trained at Haleybury, the company uh, school college in Britain, uh, had these very fixed ideas from uh, Ricardo and from Adam Smith about the way the economy worked and they saw rent exaction as a mathematical formula, something that you simply imposed uh, regardless of any cultural arrangements or, or any local differentiation. Uh, and this was a completely alien way of gathering revenue from Indian subjects. And that was one among a, a very diverse set of um, circumstances that Indians were rebelling against in 1857. Um, within the military itself, what actually helped to spark the, the mutiny among the soldiers was also an increasing perception of arrogance among British officers who no longer saw themselves in any way as sort of co-equals with Indian soldiers and were no longer seen to appreciate the contribution the Indian soldiers made, but kept themselves aloof and socially distanced uh, and their racism was ever more evident uh, against their own Indian subalterns. So that, that kind of conception of a British civilization, which had to be imposed regardless of local arrangements was something that runs throughout many of the crises that we focus on in 1857. Um, Pete, did you want to say more about the, the uprising? I don't know. I can't really answer that, to be honest. OK. OK, I'll go on to the next question. Then. How did metropolitan and overseas media play a role in imperial governance? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good question. Um, at certain times, you can see discernibly the effect of, of lobbies mobilised by the media uh, on imperial government. Um, by and large, it was when uh, governmental hypocrisy was pointed to. So one, one example is the sort of second great British crusade against slavery, not, not the 1830s one, uh, but in the 1870s this time against um, Arabic and African forms of slavery in, in East Africa and in, in West Africa. Um, this was simply not a problem for British administrations until uh, David Livingston, the, the great missionary explorer, highlighted it. And then it was picked up upon by one of our key characters, Henry Bartle Frere, and brought to the attention of the British public. And the hypocrisy of this great sort of anti-slavery nation tolerating slavery in its Western positions and doing to stamp it out despite its power in East Africa, um, drove uh, a governmental response. Um, so every now and then you have those uh, powerful lobbies and, and the role of the, the media, uh, which could play both ways. You know, in, in that case, the second anti-slavery campaign, it led to interventions against uh, African slavery. In the um, Second Opium War, uh, Palmerston was able to utilize his connection with the Times to portray this rabidly racist image of Chinese people and sway the result of a general election uh, by blatantly lying about you know, British heads being on display outside Canton with the popular press mobilizing this uh, uh, anti-Chinese racism uh, and allowing Palmerston to be re-elected in a general election of that year with an increased majority and to propagate the Second Opium War. So you, there's definitely one of the key considerations uh, that waxes and wanes through the, the 19th century and steers imperial action in certain areas uh, and not others. OK, we've got the um, next question. In what ways did technological developments impact on colonial governance across this period? Um, they certainly uh, speeded up the, the rate of communications as we go through the, the period, and they led to the, the need for these bureaucratic 
changes uh, in London, in, in the various offices in London. Um, but we have a series of sort of instances in the book um, where the advent of new technology changes the, the geopolitics. And I think one of the best examples of that actually is the, um, the route across the uh, Isthmus of Suez, which connected Britain with India. And the sort of frantic scrabble, um, Pete collected all the, the data on this, uh, the, the frantic scrabble to improve communications across Suez um, during and after the Indian uprising. Um, this is a bizarre episode where Britain wanted to try and smuggle an army to India as quickly as possible, disguised as civilians so that they wouldn't cause the Egyptians to think that there was an invasion force coming their way. And the use of steam technology and, and telegraph uh, to try and get that army across the Isthmus of Suez to India as quickly as possible. Um, Pete, you did a lot of work on the on the, the sort of disruptive technology of, of steam and then telegraph. Do you want to follow up on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um... I mean, how how technology changes, um, how developments in technology change bureaucratic and governmental structures. It's I mean, it's obviously a massive question. I mean, the, our, our first bit in 1838 has you know the Court of East India Company setting up a committee for steam power because suddenly steam power is is something that is generating enough work and is taking up enough attention that it needs its own committee um, because people are beginning to catch up with. What it actually means to be able to, you know, make a two-stroke engine and put it in a flat-bottomed boat that can sail up a river in, say, China or Africa, um, at the same time as being able to, you know, get round the um, Cape of Good Hope in six weeks. Um, with uh, with eighteen fifty-seven, I think that's a really interesting kind of uh, moment of inflection for technology because it's when um, it's when the telegraph is just starting and. The news of the Indian of, of the first mutiny in the Indian uprising at Meerut is uh, is actually communicated by telegraph, but it takes several steps because the telegraphs aren't actually aren't continuous between London and India. They uh, they have to go you know by various routes through the Persian Gulf and then across um, across say from Trieste and one goes by France as well. But these have to pass through telegraph lines owned by certain companies within certain jurisdictions. And obviously, information security is a problem. Um, overall, I mean, the structure of the empire itself is determined by where you can sail and how fast and how many people you can get there to do whatever violence is necessary. Um, but also in terms of information, we, if, if you remember, we had a really um, cool seminar in the FCDO with uh, actual diplomats and we were talking about how difficult it is to run uh, counterinsurgency imperialist war when you're on a three month communication delay. And the guy says, well, actually, try having an in email inbox. It's worse. Um, there's this multiplier effect that comes with uh, being able to transmit as much information as you like, as fast as you like around the world that begins to make actual management a lot more difficult in a lot of ways. It, it gives a kind of, it holds out the promise of. A kind of perfect control but brings you ever further away from it or makes you ever more aware of, of how illusory it is i hope that answers the question sorry no, that's good thanks Pete. um another question from the audience who are the principal beneficiaries of the empire investors the government corporations if individuals were enriched who were they uh that's a very good question because you know imperial apologists are part of the culture wars today would like us to believe that everybody benefited from the empire uh, clearly that wasn't the case uh, we've talked about some of the sort of astonishing levels of violence that were projected in the interests of britons uh, and overwhelmingly imperial officials uh, where there were trade-offs would trade off benevolent interventions against the prosperity and the security of britons so pretty much as today, you know, um, diplomats at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, Pete mentioned, uh, would have sort of three main objectives, which is British prosperity, British security and values. And certainly these imperial administrators had values. So this freedom, civilization, liberalism would have been their values. But where there was a trade off between values and security and prosperity for Britons, the latter would always triumph. Um, and to give you some examples of, of how this works in practice, clearly some people of colour benefited from British colonialism. Some were uh, accorded authority, some were able to accrue wealth through collaboration with British authorities and so on. But when it came to replacing enslaved labour after 1838, 
the Imperial administration um, worked very hard to establish a, a system whereby the population of the empire as a whole could replace enslaved labour with the labour of other people of colour. The, this was at a time when Britain itself was thought to be overpopulated by Malthusians and there were emigration schemes to shovel out paupers, as it was called. So theoretically, white Britons could have gone to replace enslaved labour working in tropical conditions and uh, producing tropical commodities in horrendous conditions. Uh, but they were seen as racially unsuited for that, whereas people of colour were seen as racially suited for that kind of work. So a system of the farming out of indentured labourers from India comes to replace uh, enslaved labour shortages and later from China as well. And to give you another example about beneficiaries of empire, um, during this transition to freedom in the, late, the mid to late 1830s, after the Anti-Slavery Act, the end of apprenticeship, um, the Britons who had invested in the, the former empire, the empire of slavery, the empire of the West Indies, um, were compensated during that transition to ensure that they didn't lose out too much. So slave owners, as many of you will know, were paid compensation amounting to 20 million pounds from the British government for the loss of their enslaved property when enslaved people were freed. And many of them used that, those compensation funds to invest in new colonization projects elsewhere, including Australia. But it wasn't just slave owners who were safeguarded, whose interests were safeguarded during this transition from one kind of empire based on slavery to another based on free trade and free labor. East India Company investors were also compensated when the company lost its commercial role. Uh, so as I've mentioned in 1833, there were still guaranteed dividends by the British government, which now came from charging rent to Indians. So the interests of British investors were taken care of to a great extent. That's not to say everybody did okay. You know, some former slave owners did lose out. Uh, some uh, plantation owners' economies collapsed. But by and large, the state was there to try and in ensure a, a smooth succession from one kind of empire to another for Britons. And the imperial state was there to ensure the replacement of slave labor with the labor of people of color, while white Britons uh, who emigrated from Britain became owners of property in the settler colonies. Uh, they resettled as, as British settlers in North America and Southern Africa and Australasia. Um, so if you look at the sort of overall balance of, of beneficiaries, putting it simply, white people and Britons generally were beneficiaries of empire, some people of color were too, but millions of people of colour were killed to establish that empire. And I think we demonstrate that just through the conflicts that we look at in our three years alone. Um, that's another question. Where do you stand on the Bernard Porter idea that empire wasn't all that important to the majority of the British population? The use is essentially driven by the interests of this small circle of officials plus those in the Foreign Office. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, my sense is that the, for the, most of the time, the majority of Britons took empire for granted uh, and they took a particular view of the empire for granted, uh, that it was by and large a benevolent force, that the British Empire was better than other empires, that it was generally doing good in the world, but that periodically, the details of an imperial outpost would come to their attention when there was a disaster in Zululand in 1879 or in Afghanistan in 1839, 1840, 1842 and so on. Uh, and at those moments, that sort of taken for granted nature of imperialism would come out into the open and there would be a furious debate. Uh, another example is that 1857 election I mentioned earlier uh, around the, the opium war in China. Uh, and those moments would give people the opportunity to mobilise new ideas about race and racism, new forms of racism in British society to continue justifying um, uh, an imperial form of rule uh, in which people of colour are generally seen as uh, you know, inferior to, to white people uh, and as proper imperial subjects. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's not just the officials in the Foreign Office or in the Colonial Office or India Office who have empire on their mind. The majority of Britons have it at the back of their mind most of the times and they have it at the forefront of their mind uh, during certain episodes. That relates back to the, the question about media earlier as well. I don't know if Kate, you want to add anything to that or, or Pete? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say as well that I think everyday life in Britain was shaped by empire in a variety of small ways even when they were imperceptible you know you watch the great british bake-off and they talk charmingly about how you know the, the 
the discovery of new kinds of sweeties in the Victorian era, and you know, the rise of in popularity of chocolates as sugar became more affordable. It's like, well, why do you think chocolate, you know, sugar became more affordable? It was off the backs of this kind of labor, you know, of people of color and off the back of the empire. Um, you know, this kind of, you know, the textiles coming in, the cotton coming from India. Um, you know, people were being shaped by it. You have the ex, um, you know, exhibitions and leisure activities that are all being kind of shaped, even by people who weren't directly invested in the empire. We're still, we're still being affected by it. And, you know, things like, you know, one of the examples he was here about, you know, tea, one of the, you know, being kind of becoming such an integral part of British culture and how, you know, British people came to see themselves is again, coming from the empire and from these imperial connections. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, another question. Uh, Following on from that previous question, how far was this interconnected colonial world evident beyond the thinking and experience of British officials? To what extent did other groups, such as indigenous peoples and settlers, place their local interests in the bigger picture? Okay. Um, I'll deal with both those those groups then, uh, indigenous peoples and, and settlers to begin with. Settlers certainly saw their interests as being part of a, a broader uh, British diaspora. Uh, one of the things that led me to this project, I mentioned that I started out in South Africa and then went to Australia. My first sort of foray into that connected, interconnected history was to look at settler newspapers um, and settler newspapers on the Eastern Cape frontier, one of the most sort of peripheral parts of the empire you can imagine were constantly extracting material from the Sydney Herald uh, in New South Wales in Australia and vice versa. The, the Nelson Examiner New Zealand was constantly extracting from the Grahamstown Journal or the South African Commercial Advertiser and they saw themselves as part of uh, a British diaspora in need of assistance, continued assistance from Britain to sustain the mass settlers in these remote wildernesses as they saw it of the empire. So absolutely, British settlers um, depended materially and morally uh, for support from the empire as a whole. Indigenous peoples, as, uh, Tracy Banavanawa Ma, a former colleague of mine at La Trobe, has, uh, has written uh, about the, the concept of imperial literacy, the ways in which indigenous peoples became aware of this wider imperial world. Uh, in, a, in a brilliant paper, she looked at uh, Maori uh, and Aboriginal and Pacific Islander uh, growing awareness during the early 19th century, uh, that the people that they were facing for the first time uh, weren't just isolated to their area. And they used various informal communication techniques, old trade techniques, travel, um, service on, on ships, uh, and acquiring that kind of literacy of this wider imperial world. And one of the, the sections in our 1879 thing, looking at the, the wars of confederation in Southern Africa, looks at the ways that different Southern African uh, peoples uh, became aware that this was a a broader imperial project to try and deprive African policies of their independence and bring about a confederation of, of white world states in the region and forge new alliances to try and combat that. So there is definitely this kind of uh, evidence of an interconnected world that is shared by colonial subjects uh, as well as by the officials running the empire from, from London. And if you want to add anything, Pete, okay. Uh, 